Hold on. What's up, guys? Can everybody even see me? I'm foggy out here. Yeah. Um, I did have some slides with fancy diagrams and things like that, uh, but you guys wouldn't be able to see much of them anyway. So we're just going to riff with it. Um, yeah, so Klusk asked me to talk. And uh, as I was going through just what to talk about, um, something I have thought a fair amount about is uh, vitalist philosophy. And so the, you know, the term vitalism and vitalist uh, is used a lot in our circles. Um, on Twitter, on Urbit, and so on, but it's usually a question of politics, aesthetics, vibes. It doesn't have too much of an explicit connection, at least, to um, what was called vitalist philosophy in the 18th and 19th centuries, when uh, mechanistic biology was first becoming a thing. Like, the whole idea that it was possible um, <clears throat> that physiological reactions could be reduced entirely, basically the animate could be reduced entirely to the inanimate. Or to, can you, is the microphone okay? Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Um, and so, like, in contrast to this, you know, new notion at the time that the animate could be reduced to a sort of finite series of the inanimate came the notion of, you know, think chi, vril, things like that, like in Solment, that there was some potentially physically detectable um, additional element that was added to the inanimate, inanimate that caused it to then become living. And this was an alternative hypothesis, something like, you know, aether as the medium for light travel. Um, and so, you know, no such thing was found. This is sort of fundamentally an unfair ask um, for the idea that the living is ontologically or metaphysically different uh, from the inanimate because it's asking you to measure in inanimate terms, right? Those of a indifferent, interchangeable outside observer. Um, something that, of course, that is actually referring to the intrinsic informational organization of the thing itself. Anyway, point being that as we went over the uh, over the course of today, um, I noticed that several of the speakers brought up things that were excellent examples, uh, or you know, very understandable examples, of the sort of the revival of vitalism, which is happening right now, not just in a philosophical sense, but also in an actually scientifically credible and productive one. Um, so this area is called you might know by the free energy principle, if anyone's familiar, or uh, the active inference paradigm, of uh, which the free energy principle is just one component. Um, so like, you know, vitalism was basically considered dead. And actually I Googled it earlier today just to see if any of the sort of normie academic philosophers had clued in to, I mean, any of the stuff involved with the free energy principle, Never mind what Jack or anyone else here uh, is talking about. And they have not, this is still considered like, you know, 150 years dead argument. But, you know, interestingly, the alternative, like the mechanistic view of life, uh, sort of in philosophical circles has not been clarified or made non-contradictory. There's not been any given any like standardized or compelling account of what a mechanistic definition of life. Um, that was not just an arbitrary list of properties or something has been since then. Mostly we've just given up for like 150 years. But so recently, so Carl Friston uh, was the creator of the free energy principle, which I'll, I will get to explaining in just one second. Uh, and then that work has been taken up by another scientist, a biologist and former computer engineer, uh, Michael Levin, who has been able to use it to do some pretty extraordinary things, um, mostly in regenerative medicine. So growing back entire functional limbs and amphibians in short periods of time, toggling ca uh, cell lines between cancerous behavior and non-cancerous cell behavior. Um, and this is all based on you know, an interpretation of this theory. And so it is taking a philosophical take on what the abstract structure of life is at every level of organization and actually applying it like at the lab bench and getting results. And so I just wanted to tell you guys a little bit about how it works and kind of how it strings together things that different people have talked about today. So free energy in this sense is not like, you know, perpetual motion machine or anything like that. It's free energy in like the sense of like thermodynamic work, um, except we're talking in information theoretic terms. So uh, an analogy, a synonym that's often used for it is surprisal. So it means like divergence from whatever your expectations were, right? As like sensory information is coming in, um, is surprisal. And so the principle is that any complex system will act to minimize the degree of surprisal that it experiences, um, both as it's perceiving things and as it's acting on them. And that this drives the perceptual motor action loop, right? So you can describe anything that you go out and do in response to sensations or perceptions that you have as attempting to minimize whatever was anomalous about those or the anomalousness of it, right? So you smell something unusual and you start looking around. That behavior of looking around is trying to get perceptual information, right? That will cancel out the surprisal of the other sensation that you have no explanation for in your existing uh, world model. Um, 
So the reason that this, the, the term free energy is used for this, because like surprisal is a little more communicative in that degree, um, is that if you conceive, if you formalize this in terms of free energy in the sense of like thermodynamic work or gravitational potential energy. So you think of like a ball that's perched on top of a hill, right? So it has a high degree of potential energy. And so any, any movement, any force that affects it is gonna cause it to fall out of that high potential energy position and towards somewhere else. It implies a space that has a natural gradient, a direction, somewhere where it will end up. And it's the same thing with um, free energy in the thermodynamic sense, which means that you have a heat reservoir and a cold reservoir, right? Like a difference in entropy. And so if there's any diffusion possible, then work is going to start moving in a particular direction. So the reason to formalize this in terms of free energy is that it gives this surprisal behavior, it puts it into a space, right? That has a natural gradient direction. And so it can drive the perception action loop of the system from like its current state towards something like, um, you know, I need to hunt a different animal because the animal that I'm used to hunting when I'm hungry, I can't find over and over again, right? And this is the surprisal builds up and it triggers like a different entire way of being. I switch to fishing perhaps, right? And the system migrates to, the, the system being the hunter in this case, migrates to a different part of its survival landscape. Um, but so like one of the things that I noticed in, um, in Aaron's uh, talk earlier today was he mentioned um, unpredictable movements, right? The difference between going to the gym and doing, you know, repetitions with perfect form of the same exercises over and over again versus the sort of unpredictability of play on, you know, broken natural terrain with other people who do things that you don't expect and so on. And so, you know, when you talk about like free energy minimization, that that's the telos of any given complex system that sustains itself and so on. Um, you know, you're, the first reaction a lot of the time is to think, well, like, you know, the way to minimize that is just to go into a coma, right? Like never leave the house, like just follow the gradient that goes towards death, like do nothing and you won't be surprised, right? <laughs> <laughs> but so if you think of like a, an analogy in an actually evolved comp system like humans, right? Um, so this would be the equivalent of thinking that if you go around in, um, you know, a plastic bubble, right? Or stay inside the house for two years because of COVID, um, that your immune system is just gonna be perfectly happy, right? Like it's gonna love it, okay, great. Like I've not encountered any negative stimulus. I haven't seen any bacteria that I've never seen before. Like, okay, everything is going great. But in reality, it does the exact opposite, right? This is where you get autoimmune issues. Um, this is where infections that previously would not have affected you so badly, infections um, become more severe and I'll, I think I mean, I observed a ton of this and I predicted it in advance actually, um, you know, six months before they finally released the lockdowns that all of these people uh, were gonna come out of their houses and we're all going to get sick and we're gonna have more autoimmune issues because they'd had no immune challenge basically for the past two years. Uh, and that you know, is indeed what happened in my observation. But so like the way to think about it is that your immune system is putting a blindfold on when you stay inside the house because it's going into a, se a sensory deprivation tank. Right. And what happens in a sensory deprivation tank? You hallucinate. Right. Like there is a there's a at a higher order level, there is a set point of first order surprisal. Right. So like first order surprisal of like I saw a bacteria I've never seen before is what drives white blood cells to go after that particular thing and allows the immune system to do its day to day, minute to minute job. Right. But so it also has a second order set point where it expects it expects to have a world, right? That's continuously presenting it with like a world-like amount of new stuff, of challenges, of things that it's responsible for. And so if all of that goes away, right? It's the world goes away. And so it starts to hallucinate, not, maybe not unlike an LLM, that the, the body, what's internal and should be thought of as part of the self is instead an evil other. You can think of it as like a paranoid hallucination, right? Like this, the, the heart tissue is out to get me or is like actually an evil invader, like the bacteria. So I'm gonna go after it because I've been, you know, been in an isolation chamber for a year. And this is sort of like the way to think about like autoimmune disorders is like a cognitive disorder of the immune system due to like deprivation of stimulus. Um, where was I going with this? Uh, oh yeah, right, exactly. Um, so going back to the, the motion thing, the actually like moving around in like not an abstract space, but the literal 3D physical space that we actually inhabit, you can, in a similar way to between like the individual you know, T cell that's doing first order surprise minimization. And then the, the entire immune system that expects to like model a world in which surprisal is happening. Um, you compare like a single muscle with the entire ensemble of muscles, right? Any one muscle is acting on a, it has a very specific set of forces 
that pass through it and that is doing a minimization process on the stresses that might arise from those forces. But it's getting most of those forces from other muscles in the system, right? Not just like arbitrary external getting hit by a car causes, right? And the set of muscles as a whole is attempting to, um, to maintain like to maintain the balance of its strength and its connections, right? Like you know, if you lift too much, you know, you build. Um, what is like the thing? It's uh, the starting strength build. You know, if you like do squats like three times as much as you bench for like months on end, then you end up with like a pinched chest and like gigantic quads and ass and everything, <laughs> right? And this is like an extremely dangerous like physiognomy to have, right? Like if you actually do anything functional with that, you're rapidly going to injure yourself. Right, and so this this idea that if you move across an unpredictable space, uh, at a higher level, you're providing the balance of different forces, you know, net average of different forces and different like good interactions required between your muscles to keep their, you could say like the pieces of their mind, uh, all in sync with each other and balanced appropriately, and so you're minimizing surprisal, on that level. Um, I had another one. Oh yes, right. Of course. I mean. The, uh, the circadian pill in general, um, you know, everything that Jack works on, chronobiology and photomedicine and so on. Um, this is obviously a huge one. What we, you know, the circadian cycles, any kind of clock process, I mean, what in circadian biology they call um, a zeit giver, a time giver. Uh, and I think there's not as much evidence of this as far as I know. Maybe Jack has some input, but yeah, there's also infradian and ultradian rhythms, right? There's stuff besides um, just the sun that is able to give us this kind of external clock, like, you know, moon, tides. Etc. Um, you know, if, if for the software engineers, right, this is this is computational offloading, right? Like you have an exterior clock process, right, and you can lean on that so that you don't have to do all of the ticks, like for different processes yourself. You can lean on those for a clock, and this allows you to do more efficient work and more easily synchronize with things. Um, and so, like all of this is a way of you know minimizing surprisal and increasing your ability to minimize surprisal on many different cybernetic orders of action. Um, and so an interesting thing that, uh, yeah, that's what that one was Ben, right? It was sort of looking at the, uh, the vitamin D immune system relationship and therefore like sun and circadian rhythm with immune system relationship, right? So the, the immune system and the circadian system are both kind of frontline free energy buffers for us, right? Like they're basic, they're, they're basic surfaces for how we interact with the world. One with like the temporal rhythms of the world that we offload compute to, and then the immune system you could think of as like the spam information blitz, like potentially pathological information that's around us um, all the time. And so the interesting thing, that one, of, one of the many reasons that the, having this abstraction of free energy is useful is because even if you don't yet know the specific mechanism that can, might connect these two systems, you can predict, you can reasonably guess that impairing one is going to have an effect on the other without knowing any of the physiological details you can make that hypothesis because free energy, even though it doesn't correspond in any given case, like in all cases, to a single physical quantity, it is a real informational quantity that the system as a whole is trying to do something with, right? And so the circadian system and the immune system can be expected to buffer each other. And one would so say if one is disturbed, the other can pick up the slack. Or if both of the, you know, if one is being disturbed and the other is disturbed as well, then you're really screwed as people were um, staying inside of their houses and both like, depriving their immune system of challenge and depriving themselves of these external site gavers. Um, trying to think. I had this all in my head and then I just like monologued about Bitcoin for an hour and just completely dumped my stack. And so like two thirds of what I had like memorized to talk about is just like gone. Uh, slides probably would have been helpful. Uh, yeah, just going back to vitalism. I guess, and understanding, you know, like what it is that we're, how, the way in which this has um, sort of taken us back to a less mechanistic and more vitalistic, but now on a better and more effective, like scientific and engineering standing than it was during the 19th century. Because like, ultimately the reason that it died then was because like it couldn't, it had no results, right? There was nothing to look for if you were looking for like the life force in itself, right? You know, in terms of like, you can't, injections are not gonna get it for you. Like taking photographs is not going to get it for you. Um, but and so we went for a century where basically what we did was catalog like small inanimate, like mechanical components of the biological system and their relationships with each other, which is okay. Great. If, if you took that in isolation, that is a useful thing. 
Um, but when that is like, as a matter of philosophical dogma, is deprived of any relationship with cognitive or experiential behavior of these systems, like what it is, what is it like to be a cell? Like what is it like, especially for to be a cell, which among many others is now a tissue, an organ, and has an identity like that. Um, so this is, yeah. So this is how actually the toggling between cancer and non-cancer cell lines thing works with uh, Levin's work. Is so cells uh, it also connects with jack's work because he focuses on bioelectricity so the way that cells communicate with each other and basically continually reinforce the fact that you are all part of a heart or a stomach is through this cell cell ion receptor using electrical signaling and it's what nerve the nervous system evolved from this is much older than that and these mechanisms became specialized in nerves but they're present in every cell in the body and they're how an embryo developed the figures out how to develop into a body plan and different tissues and so on. So it turns out if you disrupt the signaling, the cell that it was disrupted is uh, drops out of contact like your immune system in the bubble. Um, it forgets that it's supposed to be part of a multicellular organism and it goes back to behaving like a single celled one. And this is the, atom, the atavism theory of cancer is that it's a reversion to unicellular behavior. It's what it's like metastasis, right? Like replicate as much as possible, spread as far as possible. Um, they also behave metabolically in ways that are more similar to unicellular organisms. Uh, there's a lot of things that change in that way. And, you know, the experimental support here is that you can take normal cells, cut them off from their cognitive network that they're part of, that gives them a sense of identity in being part of a tissue, and then see them start behaving cancerously, restore the communication between the cells, stops. They go back to behaving like normal. So this way of... This way of developing treatments and interacting with bodily uh, systems, Levin call, calls them agential materials, right? He compares it to the difference between, you know, if you stack cinder blocks into a pyramid, like, okay, all you have to do is stack them, and they until they're kicked over, they will stay like that. If you try to stack dogs into a pyramid, um, you're going to have a much harder time. you got to train the dogs to, like, get into a pyramid and stay in a pyramid and things like that, and they may jump off anyway. But unlike uh, cinder blocks if like a wind blows the pyramid of dogs over and they're well-trained, they know how to get back into the pyramid again, right? They can self-heal, they can change their configuration and things like that. And so we've treated mostly biology like cinder blocks for the past 150, basically the entire time that we've had such a thing as modern medicine and biology. And we're now at the point, and this is what I think is like sort of neo-vitalistic, um, that we can start to treat them like dogs like things that can be trained and are our peers that have mind, even when we're talking about like gene networks, you know, groups of cells, embryos, supersets of embryos, which apparently develop their own transcriptome. It's a whole thing. Um, but yeah, so treating these things as like cognitive agents that one trains as opposed to like receptors that one develops a drug to target, right? Like we bind it and we do the thing, whatever it is that like we imagine the semantics of like the NMDA receptor are which like I've yet to see uh, compelling for almost anything, um, like a really a not overcoded interpretation of what it is. Um, instead think of like, you know, a tissue, a network as a thing that has an experience and then ask like, how do I convince it to do this or keep doing this or stop doing that, right? Um, or is it, you know, what is it, if it's doing something wrong, you know, what is, what mental illness does it have? He has a really good paper on, um, on diabetes as a psychiatric illness of the pancreas, which sounds incredibly schizo, but it's like, actually, you know, there, there's math that works. Uh, <laughs> and there's a lot, many such cases. Uh, and so it's extremely exciting to see that, I mean, especially since it's working for developing fully functional new limbs um, for amphibians to imagine that, you know, we could actually talk to our bodies, learn, their communication protocol, understand something about their, you know, different parts of our bodies anyway, their cognitive framework. And then through that, um, by, by that means, get them to change their morphology, to like grow a new arm, to heal their own sort of psychiatric illness, which is causing them to respond to signals like insulin or glucagon poorly. Um, and that this is like, this is something that's, because you're working with dogs and, with, yeah, and the body, which is already has many evolved routines to be able to adapt in these ways that you know we don't use in daily life very much but if we can talk to it figure out that that's there and trigger it 
that instead of having to spend 30 years and billions of dollars going through like 300 different ligands of this receptor to find that 280 of them are toxic, 10 of them do nothing. And then like the next 10 are our drug candidates and eight of those don't work. And then the last two, I guess it's worth like putting them on the market or something. You know, we could actually leverage the intrinsic evolved complexity that's already in the body by treating it as a mind and not as a thing. Um, and we now have an actual scientific and mathematical basis to do that. Um, and I hope to see that integrated, you know, that kind of um, thinking and hopefully like more formalism, more experimental decentralized science that addresses this stuff integrated into uh, all the things that we're working on together here. Uh, thanks for listening to me, Ramble, guys. Great.